from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's September 20th, 2017. I'm Jennifer Cutting. I'm a Folklife Specialist in the American Folklife Center. And I'm here with Kathy Fink and Marcy Markser, who've just participated in the Take the Archive Challenge concert in our Homegrown Concert Series. Kathy and Marcy, thank you for taking the Archive Challenge. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> this is wonderful. Um, you sounded wonderful on the stuff that you picked. and. What was interesting to me is that some of the folks in the Archive Challenge came into the reading room to select their material, and some of you selected it online. And you guys didn't come into the reading room but found great stuff online. And I wondered, you know, were there any particular challenges about finding it online as opposed to coming into to the reading room? There, there are definitely different experiences, but because we were, from the time we heard about the challenge to, the, to today, we were traveling so much mm. that we knew we weren't going to have um, the time to come in and sit and do that away from travels and things like that. And it was such an incredible experience to have the luxury of listening on the road through the magic of the archives on the internet. And in some ways it probably offered us different opportunities than doing this live and in person, mm -hmm. simply because you can just keep scrolling through. And honestly, I would say that I probably got lost in about 12 hours of listening. Wow. That's and amazing amount of listening. It's an amazing amount of listening, and some of it were, were pieces that I was familiar with. A lot of it were pieces I wasn't familiar with. I probably earmarked 10 pieces for us to consider that we didn't mm -hmm. do, uh -huh. but that are now on our list of, oh, there's a song I'd like to do sometime. Oh, great. And Maybe there's an album in it. <laughs> there, That'd be great. There could very well. I mean, there could be so many albums in it. And and particularly of things that are not terribly well known or not known at all. You mm -hmm. know, and I think that's one of the beauties is that there is this archive of common ground and obscurities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, hidden gems. Hidden yep. gems. You know, they're mm -hmm. little diamonds in the sand. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great experience to do that listening. And by example, um, we played a medley of fiddle tunes collected by Alan Jabor, the mm -hmm. founder of the American Folklife Center, um, of him and his wife Karen collecting fiddle tunes from a Southern Virginia fiddler named Henry Reed. And both of the tunes that we picked are tunes that we knew. Mm -hmm. But to listen in detail to exactly how Henry Reed played them, and bring that back 30 to 40 years after learning those tunes Wow, is a really nice experience. Huh. And I have to say that it gave me a renewed, huge appreciation, not only for Alan's work, because Alan Jabor's work filtered out to us all through the people he hung with in Chapel Hill, Durham, North Carolina, starting a band called the Hollow Rock String Band, touring and performing with a bunch of different string bands and recording some of those tunes that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, everybody was learning from those secondhand recordings. Yep. And at the time, no internet, you'd be lucky to hear a firsthand recording. Yeah. Now, we're lucky that we can hear them either on the internet or a beautiful visit here. Well, it's a thank you for being so eloquent ab about that experience. It's a great case for us continuing to put collections online. I I can't beg you enough <laughs> to continue putting them online. And the, the archives is magic. 
though. I mean, there's so much in there. You can sit down and listen to the original recordings in the Library of Congress and in, in the Folk Archives, and it's, uh, it's unbelievable. But one of the things the Internet does is lets other people experience some of that magic. You know, right? Uh, there's nothing like listening to the original recordings. Absolutely nothing. But at least there's a way into that music. And, and for feel. busy musicians on yeah. the road, yeah. like you guys, absolutely. And I feel like you know, knowing that Sam Gleaves was going to be here and accompanying us. Sam mm -hmm. lives in Berea, Kentucky. Uh -huh. He had become uh, good friends with Jean Ritchie and her mm -hmm. family, and we worked with Jean many times over the last uh, forty years or so accompanied her at some festivals, been to, you know, parties and soirees and jam sessions and, and all of that. And so we knew that we wanted to do something of Jean's. Mm -hmm. We also knew that we didn't want to do something of hers that was well known uh -huh. or had been done a lot. Mm -hmm. We wanted to dig in there. And so there's that short little song, if I, was, if I Were a Blackbird, which she learned from someone in Ireland, but it was while she was on a Fulbright scholarship mm -hmm. researching the connections between Appalachian music and British Isles music. And so we were right at the corner of the two places in her life uh -huh. at that time. And um, I didn't know the background. That was, to me, very influential. And, and then add to that, that Sam had also spent a lot of time with Jean. Uh -huh. We felt that it was important to also keep this very personal. Mm -hmm. And because Alan and a lot of his uh, musical buddies were mentors of ours, and as was Jean, as well as friends, mm -hmm. we just sort of felt like, oh, we get to learn, we get to honor these people at the same time. We hear mm -hmm. something new, and I guarantee you, we'll be back in those archives on the road a great, lot. Great to hear. Great to hear. Well, when I went back to re-listen to those tunes that you chose, um, I was struck by how possibly challenging it could be to, you know, for example, with the uh, the tune Granny, it seemed to my ear to have an extra beat at the end of the A music. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, are they going to even it out? Are they going to put the extra beat <laughs> in there? And uh, it just flowed the way you did it. it was and I think that Henry Reed was not always consistent mm -hmm. in where that extra beat might happen or might not happen. And I know that he played for a lot of dances. He also played um, banjo and harmonica. Mm -hmm. And uh, my guess is that he knew enough in a dance not to throw the extra beat in. <laughs> when there are dancers <laughs> dancing, right. Um, I had mentioned before to you that uh, one of those tunes turned up on a Flying Fish album in I think it was, was it? Shoes and Stockings. Shoes oh, yeah. and Stockings turned up on uh, Sandy's Fancy right. on mm -hmm. the Flying Fish mm -hmm. label in 81. But you said you were playing it before that. Well, I learned the tune in the late 70s from Irene Herman, mm. who was a member of the Harmony Sisters with Alice Gerard and Jeannie McCleary. Ah, okay. And Irene was hanging out at Alice's house, and I was down the street at uh, Helen Schneer's house in Kensington, Maryland, Garrett mm -hmm. Park area. And uh, I think Irene had probably learned the tune from Alan. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first exposure to that tune. Um, and then, of course, Alan recorded it with uh, Sandy Bradley. And it was re-released as a double album, I think, with the Hollow Rock String Band and Sandy's Fancy. It was mm -hmm. re-released as one CD. Okay. And that gets a fair amount of play in our car on the road, actually. Oh, great. Love those tunes and love hearing them, love hearing Alan play them. Brings back a lot of memories to hear Sandy accompany him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a great way of just keeping this stuff alive. I mean, the music, the music exists, but the music is part of the stories. And with each of these tunes, Marcy has a story, I have a story, mm -hmm. Sam has a story, mm -hmm. Alan has a story, Henry Reed has a story, and then all of these stories swirl around each other and what do you know, next thing is Sam's whole generation, 40 years younger than us. They embrace this, they have stories, and it keeps on going. It morphs, mm -hmm. as it should, 
you know, Sam Gleaves is an amazing songwriter, but right in the heart center of the kind of tradition that Gene Ritchie wrote songs in. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's where we gather our strength from the people before us. That's beautifully put, beautifully put. And, and today, Alan Jabor's tunes that he collected as played by you have come home. Mm -hmm. And Gene Ritchie's song that's in our collection has come home. Um, with that particular song, uh, If I Were a Blackbird, it was sung unaccompanied. Mm -hmm. And when I listened to what you did with it, adding Penny Whistle, and I was not able to get out into the audience during the concert, so I couldn't tell, were you playing in a, in a standard tuning or an alternate tuning? No, I actually played guitar in a banjo tuning. Oh, that's interesting. And on this song, we played around with about six or seven different arrangement possibilities. Uh -huh. I talked about playing it on the on the dulcimer since Jean was such a beautiful dulcimer player. And uh -huh. I actually, dulcimer was my third instrument. Piano first, guitar second, dulcimer third. And I thought about that and we loved the song so much we realized that we were going to want to be performing it mm. outside of this concert. We're doing a lot of shows together That's with Sam. That's great news to us. And so I thought, you know, I love the dulcimer, but we're not going to be taking it on the road. Mm -hmm. Where can I get the drones? And sort of that, again, that cross section between where Appalachian and British Isles music and vibes meet. Mm -hmm. And so I knew it was going to be an open tuning on the guitar. And I also thought, you know, I could put this in a banjo modal tuning. Ah. So that's what I did is I put my guitar in a banjo modal tuning uh -huh. um, and uh, it, it gave me all the drones that I wanted, which uh -huh. is what the dulcimer would give us. Mm -hmm. And then Sam added some of that along with the melody on the fiddle. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Marcy captured some of that Irish, Irish. ornamentation exactly. in her beautiful vocal. In her vocal. And the penny whistle. And the penny whistle. And it turned, you know, I think the thing is, it's a great example of a, a tiny little melody. I mean, Gene's recording is very short. It is short. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny little melody, but it's such a beautiful melody. And it's just a great story. And mm -hmm. you want to hear it over and over again. Plus you don't tire of it. Yeah. And so we felt like, well, if we introduce it with the fiddle and then some of the story comes out and then a little more story in the fiddle and the penny whistle that we we could more thoroughly tell this story mm -hmm. um, and it just felt like what we wanted to be doing with it mm -hmm. and uh, I my guess we're about to make a recording so this may end up on it that's wonderful so your the arrangement that you put together for today's archive challenge concert will go on to have a life absolutely it mm -hmm. all goes around again so well it does and it goes around in another way I mean Kathy touched on this but to us not only to know that their music is here and it's always available to anybody who wants to hear it is remarkable but these are people who were our friends you know, uh, we could have gone another way, mm -hmm. but uh, with Alan and Jean, they're people that we knew our entire careers until they passed, which was recent. Mm -hmm. And um, with Alan, we spent years playing at folk festivals and uh, Cliff Top Jam festivals with him and Mike Seeger. And, and uh, with Jean, you know, we just loved her. And we got hired years ago to play a festival that she was at, the, the Golden Link in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really happy because I'd get a whole hour of Jean Ritchie and she was going to play solo. And then she, this was so long ago, I can't remember how long it was, but then she asked us to play with her. So we thought, oh yeah, that's nice too. And, and then she said, well, I want it to be just like my records. So we ran to the CD table, bought records and went to the car <laughs> and learned the arrangements on the records as fast as we could and wow. hoped for the best. But then we had a, a repertoire with Jean. You know, uh -huh. we, we knew her stuff. <laughs> About how much of it? Was it a whole, you know, uh, hour? It was an hour. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was an hour off three different CDs, and she gave us a list of songs. Oh, wow. So, so that was great. But then to see that this is available to people 
anybody who wants to hear it, young people doing research, older people doing research, people who want to delve into the, to the music further, it's just such a great resource. I want to say too. Thank you for your work. It's oh, really remarkable. Thank you for thanking us. In listening uh, to Gene's recordings that Alan Lomax made, and this particular recording was made in his apartment in Greenwich Village. Exactly. Um, Third Street, 1949. June 2nd, 1949. So neither mm -hmm. of us was around yet. Um, but when you listen to her sing, the purity and clarity of her voice is so there. And Jean had so, that, that remained part of her singing. It was, you know, I want to say unadulterated. It was, it was a, such a pure sopr Appalachian soprano mm -hmm. and just beautiful to hear the young Jean Ritchie sing and make that connection mm -hmm to various other stages in her career where we got to hear her. Mm -hmm. You heard her at many stages of, of the life cycle. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, it's wonderful to know that you went back so far with her, that you had this connection with her and with Alan Jabour. And as I say, it's all come home today with this concert. And we very much appreciate both of you coming and sharing your arrangements of these songs and tunes and taking the archive challenge. Thank you, Kathy and Marcy. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. This was a, it was a, a pleasure and a treat. It was great. Thank you. September 20th, 2017. I'm Jennifer Cutting, a folklife specialist in the American Folklife Center, and I'm here with klezmer genius Seth <laughs> Keibel. We've just concluded the archive challenge sampler concert that took place in the Coolidge Auditorium in which musicians were invited to identify field recordings that they could fall in love with and put their own creative stamp on and play for a very appreciative audience. And they were appreciative today. Oh, yeah. Um, you played a medley of tunes from the Ruth Rubin collection mm -hmm. uh, from a musician called Bearish Cats. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about Bearish Cats? Sure. Well, uh, Barish Katz was a fiddler, a uh, violinist. He also worked as a bodkin in the old country. Now, a bodkin was kind of like, uh, imagine a cross between a ringmaster for a circus and a wedding planner for a Jewish wedding. You know, Jewish weddings in the old country were, were very confusing and complicated affairs. They, you know, took place for several days, often as long as a week. Uh, involved the entire community. There was no such thing as a guest list. And uh, took place in various locations, indoors and outdoors, throughout the shtetl or village. So the bodkin was responsible for, you know, making sure everyone did what they were supposed to do and, and were where they were supposed to be at the right time and organizing the sequence of events and uh, um, making sure everyone did what they were supposed to do at the right time, but also introducing people and just generally making sure the guests had a good time. Again, kind of an MC ringmaster sort of person. Um, and uh, yeah, Barish Katz did that in the old country and he apparently came from a log line of Bodkins. And Ruth Rubin, well, all right, let me back up. The Ruth Rubin archive is, is a legendary archive in, in Jewish music. I mean, it's just been a treasure trove of material, uh, mostly from the Ashkenazi, Eastern European Jewish tradition. Now, a vast majority of the countless hours Ruth Rubin recorded is of vocal music. She traveled all over the world, throughout New York, Israel, all over, and uh, getting people to sing these songs for her. Um, now, I'm not a vocalist. So I was very intrigued by the Ruth Rubin archives and enjoyed listening to stuff. But I found this tape by this fiddler. I thought, okay, this is something I can like directly tackle. So Barish Katz was originally from Galatia, which is, um, well, I guess it's today present part of present day Poland and Ukraine. And he played for Ruth Rubin in 1947, all these songs that he said he learned from his uncle in the old country, in the town where they grew up, which is called Glina. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it, was, it was great to listen to because there were all these little snippets, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, just tune after tune after tune. And like so much of this music, everything sounded vaguely familiar to me, 
but nothing was actually something I had heard before. So oh. it was all like, you know, new melodies and new repertoire uh, for me, which was so much fun to sink my teeth into. And you did a great job of arranging them into two separate medleys. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide which tunes to put in which medley? Yeah, you know, what, what I did is, um, first I listened a lot to the, to the recordings after you guys so kindly digitized them for me. And um, I picked a whole bunch of melodic snippets that I liked, mm -hmm. that I just, I, in and of themselves, again, unaccompanied violin. And then I transcribed those. So then, you know, midway through this process, I had all these transcriptions of all these little different melodic fragments or short excerpts. Uh -huh. And then I began to think, okay, how can I group these together in ways that make various, at least some semblance of sense? And I, I tried to balance it, because what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure some of the melodies were presented in a more traditional light, uh, perhaps closer to the way Berish Katz himself might have performed them in an ensemble. And then some of them I wanted to put my own spin on them, uh, partially because I love to keep it a you know living, breathing tradition, and partly because it's just more fun. It's kind mm -hmm. of self-indulgent. Um, so I just found, I experimented on my own, playing them in different combinations, and what if I put this one here and this one there, you know? It, it almost seems kind of mathematical. I had numbered them all. So I had like, okay, what if I go from seven to nine to three? And then, okay, that doesn't work. How about seven, nine, two, you know? And eventually I came up with these two melodies that seemed to flow pretty naturally. Thanks for describing your process, which I was wondering about as I heard your, yeah, your medleys, sure. which so nicely moved uh, from different tempos to different tonalities. Speaking of tonalities, the field recordings that you were working with were just unaccompanied melodies. Right. And yet you came with a pianist, Sean Lane, mm -hmm. who was playing chords with these melodies. Yeah. Now, did you decide on what chords were going to be played with the melodies, or did Sean, or was it a combination of? It was mostly me. I, mm -hmm. I sat down, and uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bad pianist. And, uh, and a good down. arranger. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And I uh, sat down and worked out harmonizations uh, uh -huh. for all these things. And again, different melodies I took different approaches to. Some I said, okay, what... A lot of the melodies are pretty obvious what the original harmonies were. I'm like, let right. me go with what it probably was, mm -hmm. you know. And then there were some other melodies, like the waltz we ended mm -hmm. with, where I'm like, okay, no, I'm not going to go with what was probably the original harmonies. I'm mm -hmm. going to put some jazz substitutions and some chords that probably would have made bearish cats keel over, you know, <laughs> I don't have no idea. I noticed uh, that you, you started that? with a straight waltz and went into a jazz waltz yep. time. Yeah. yeah. And that was fun. Yep. Um, and, and on one of the tunes, I noticed you used uh, some kind of Latino rhythm. Yeah, yeah, we used that kind of Montuno beat, uh, kind of a Latin beat, which fit remarkably well. It did. Under the, what was originally probably a traditional klezmer freilach or bulgar. Uh-huh. Um, in fact, we were talking, we might, at least that part, we might just play on gigs. And no, oh, one, no one would even know. No one would even know where it came from. That would be great news for it, us. It worked shockingly well. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, that was fun. It was great. And tell me about the process of incorporating Sean into your arrangement. Well, Sean and I have worked together for years and years and years. And the nice thing about working with a musician who you're very good friends with and work mm -hmm. very well with is that you don't really have to worry about their ego. So we were able to rehearse and I could, you know, I can easily say, I don't like what you just did. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about him taking it personally. He knows I respect him and like his musicianship. So that made it very easy to kind of um, get him to do what I was hearing in my head, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, we're, we, we're so used to working together. I was able to say, okay, that I liked, or, you know, change this feel or do something here. And um, he, he's someone who originally, well, he has classical training, but is very accomplished jazz pianist. But then through me has done a fair amount of Jewish music as well. Mm -hmm. So he's got some background in that as well. And we tried to bring all of that into the arrangements we did. Have you ever tackled field recordings before, or is this your first time using them? This is certainly the first time I've done this in, in any serious degree. I mean, mm -hmm. this was kind of a new experience for me. It was so much fun coming into the archives and just listening to this stuff. And, and you know, it, uh, listening to some of these field recordings, it almost feels like the closest thing I will ever come to an actual time machine. Mm. You know, you feel almost voyeuristic. I mean, it's one thing when you're listening 
to a commercial recording, even one that's made, you know, 80, 90 years ago, you, you know the musicians being listened to are expecting or at least hoping that other people will listen to that music. This is different. This is this strange woman comes into this guy's apartment, you know, and says, play me some songs, play into this machine. You know, even though it was 1947, I've got to think that would have been beyond, almost beyond his comprehension. I don't want to say that in too insulting a way, but just like hard to fathom that those melodies he was playing in that moment in 1947 would be reinterpreted some 60, is my math right? 60 years later, no, 70. 70. 70 years later in the Library of Congress. I mean, that, and that, when I think about that, that almost gives me goose pimples. Like I said, I feel kind of voyeuristic, almost, you know, that's, that's a little window in time right there. So anyway, I totally enjoyed the process. It was, it was a real thrill. Well, we totally enjoyed having you, and <laughs> I just want to thank you, Seth Keibel, and I want to thank your accompanist, Sean Lane, for mm -hmm. taking the Archive Challenge. Yes, thank you. September 20th, 2017, and I'm Jennifer Cutting, Folk Life Specialist with the American Folk Life Center here at the Library of Congress. We're here with Brazilian musician Cisa Paz, who has just performed in our Homegrown Concert Series Archive Challenge concert. And I'm happy to be talking to Cisa now about how she chose the field recordings that she chose. and what the process of arranging them was like. So first I'll ask you, um, of the Brazilian collections that I recommended to you, mm -hmm. how did you home in on the Discoteca collection? Well, I, I listened to all of it, and all of it was so rich and exciting, and it, it was really hard to choose one, I mean two. I had to choose two pieces, so which was nice. But I knew that I wanted to work with something that was related to the African and the Indian influence. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I was looking for and finding things that I could relate to uh, from my background as well as from my, my musical experience. So it, was, it wasn't too bad once I started listening to everything and I, I found some favorite ones and I kind of said, okay, these, I think I'm gonna do these. And then I was still like, oh, but maybe I wanna do this one too, <laughs> you know? It was hard, a hard decision. Do you want me to speak specifically on each one? Yeah, the, the two that you chose were Omina Terra Terra mm -hmm. and uh, Tamanquero Eu Quero Um Par. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Omina Tere Tere, eh, I thought it was interesting because Mina actually means uh, a person who comes from the area of uh, what is Benin right now. Okay. And and when I did, you know, my ancestry map, whatever it's called, I The I DNA saw, testing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that that's where, where my heritage is from, from Benin. Oh. So, of course, I instantly, I was like, oh, this is cool, I wanna do this. Um, makes sense, it's like connected. And, that's and a also, very personal connection. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was personal and I thought it was a beautiful song and I thought I could do something you know, all these songs are, are simple, so it's not like I didn't do anything very complex with them. I just, I found a few chords that, that work together with the, the melody, and I kind of put it together that way, and it worked. And I, I liked it anyway. I thought it was nice. Oh. And then I added some more melodies, and it was cool. And you actually got people in the Coolidge Auditorium <laughs> up to dance. That is, you yeah. go down in history for that. <laughs> that alone. That's great. It but, was fun. So... The field recordings that you chose, when I listened to them, um, I thought what's interesting is, first of all, they're not accompanied with anything but percussion, Yeah. Uh, so you had to add chords to them. Mm -hmm. Also, with Tamanquero, it was like this rapid fire, almost like machine gun rapid fire of quick words, yeah. and I wondered how you were going to deal uh -huh. with that. Mm -hmm. Did you slow it down a little? Um, not really. I mean, I think it was pretty fast. And it's like, there is a, a specific style in Brazilian music where we speak, and in, in Africa too, if you notice, the it's almost spoken. It's almost like a precursor to hip hop or something, mm -hmm. where you, you speak really fast, but you're singing, and you're going 
really and it's bad. almost percussive. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's percussive, and it, it's, but it's melodic, and it kind of all blends and works together. But it is harder to work with than if you're just working with a smooth melody. So that's why I added some, I added a little bit of a hook in the beginning and in the end, and I just mm -hmm. to make it a little bit more chill and melodic, but also work with the the dance vibe because I really wanted people to at least in their sit, dance in their seats, and they uh -huh. ended up some of them ended up standing they got up, up and dancing, which was they really did. nice. Yeah, so it, wor it worked out. Mm -hmm. And I think on the Omina Tere Tere. Was it kind of a um, a layered vocal where in the field recording the main singer would sing a little bit and then another singer would come in kind of over that mm -hmm. and sing a little bit? And I wondered how you were going to handle doing that as a soloist when there were actually more singers on the field recording. Yeah. So that style is very common across Africa and Brazil, which is the call and response. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what she was doing. And I just treated it more like a song, and I repeated it, and I kind of, I did the call and response myself. So I, I called and I responded by myself, and, and it worked. And then I tried to change, uh, change the harmony a little bit so that it would sound like some layers on there, even though it's just one voice. Yeah. What was it like trying to transcribe the words to um, caboclo and Candomblé material that might not be in your spoken vocabulary. Yeah, you know what's interesting is that I don't know what the words say, and there was no translation in the materials that I had. So I, I but at the same time, when I was listening and reading it, I, I could feel a um, familiarity with the sounds because I am familiar with a lot of the Candomblé music. The uh, Yoruba tradition and the, the Congo and what they call the Shango tradition in, in the north. It's all, it's all in my blood already because I've been listening to it since I was little, even though I don't really know exactly what they're saying, but I do understand a few words here and there. And so it wasn't too difficult. It was mm -hmm. actually harder to understand the Tamanquera song, which was okay. in Portuguese, uh -huh. only because he was he was slurring his words and he had a very thick accent, and the recording was difficult to understand. Yeah. And I so I had to make some of that up because I'm like I don't know exactly what he's saying. I'm kind of getting some words, but I'm not getting everything he's saying. So the but the Mina Tere Tere was shorter and it was more it, it was easier to make out what she was saying. And what language was that in? Was I'm pretty that sure that was Yoruba. But Yoruba. I could be wrong. I could be uh -huh. mistaken because I, I didn't find uh, information on that, on mm -hmm. the materials I had. Mm -hmm. so. so tell me about the uh, process of incorporating Fernando in, into the work. Once Did you do the work first of deciding on the chords, uh, deciding on the words, mm -hmm. and, and then did you bring Fernando in later? Yeah, that's exactly right. So Fernando is very talented percussionist, and he's very creative with the instrumentation that he uses and the ideas that he has. And actually, we, we didn't get a whole lot of time to, to work on this, but I think we're going to continue to work on these songs in the oh. future. And he was talking about maybe, maybe making doing a, a percussion arrangement to, to one of these songs. And maybe we'll record it in the future. Who knows? Oh, that's wonderful yeah. news. And make sure you tell us if I you will. do put it on a recording, because we'll brag about you. Yay. <laughs> so um, when did you come to this country? 1994. OK. Long time ago. And but where were you born? I was born in Belgium mm -hmm. because my father was working there. So I was, I was born there by chance. I didn't, I didn't get to have Belgian citizenship, but my, oh. my Brazilian friends make fun of me. They're like, you're not a real Brazilian. I'm like, where am I from then? <laughs> <laughs> but I was raised there from age two. And then I moved here when I was like 17, 18. You're raised in Brazil from age two. Yeah. And then you came here when mm -hmm. you were 18. Like 18, 17, 18. Yeah, and it was a really difficult culture shock when I first arrived because that age is just really difficult mm. to be to be moving when you're just kind of discovering who you are and what you want to be and what your place is in the world and and then you're displaced into a brand new culture, a brand new language, brand new. I I already spoke English, but everything else was really difficult to to understand and kind of adapt to. It took me a little while. Yeah. Now I'm happy. Now I like living here. <laughs> Great. Have you found a large Brazilian community? Yeah, huge. And I've always been very, very um, connected to the Brazilian community. 
uh, very in love with my culture, and that was one of the things that was hardest moving here was that I was I just really wanted to participate in the culture, and I wanted to make sure I knew the dances and I and I knew the the music and I knew the culture, and the I, it was just very very important to me. So I've always remained very connected to that, um, and always traveled a lot back home all the time. I, I would take semesters off from college and go back all the time. So. Always connected. <laughs> and your usual performing repertoire, how would you characterize it? I do a lot of, uh, so when I do, like let's say a club gig, for example, I will do a lot of covers because I know that that's what people want to hear. Mm -hmm. Foho is something that's very popular and it's similar rhythm to the coco, which is the tamanquero song mm -hmm. that we played and people love to dance it. It's a very easy dance and just fun. It's just fun. And the name comes from when in the Northeast they would welcome the, the, the military uh, Americans that would be there mm -hmm. working to the parties by naming the parties for all. And the, so the, right in front of the party door it would say for all and it became for all, for all, for all, for all, for all, for all. It became for all. <laughs> and that's kind of how it came about. And it's just something that never dies. In Brazil there's a lot of fashions that, that go through you know, oh, now this music is, is super popular. Uh, Sertanejo is super popular right now. And then it was, there was Lambada a long time ago. Then it, there's always something new. But forró, samba, some of these artistic, what they call erudito kind of music, just stays with us. And that's a beautiful thing that it does. And forró is one of these things. So I play a lot of, I play a, some forró and I play a lot of samba. Samba is, is one of the things is, that are very close to my heart. Samba is is very very um, very dear to me. So I always do a lot of samba. I do a lot of forró. Sometimes I'll play a little chorinho. I'll play the songs from my CD, which are mostly originals and different, but people really enjoy it. So it's a blessing to be able to perform here and have people appreciate the music and seek it out and and support. It's just I feel really fortunate that people enjoy the music. Yeah. Well, we feel really fortunate that you took the Archive Challenge, mm -hmm. accepted it, and came and performed these amazing field recordings from the late 1930s, yeah. recorded in northern Brazil mm -hmm. as part of the Discoteca collection. And I know that people will enjoy, for generations on, enjoy the recordings of your performance today. Wonderful. So thank it's, you. Sisa Paz. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. September 20th, 2017, and we just had the Archive Challenge concert at which we asked a group of musicians to learn material from the American Folklife Center archive here at the Library of Congress. And one of those musicians was the great Phil Wiggins, who is a blues harmonica player and singer and who is a 2017 recipient of the National Heritage Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Yep. And this is Phil Wiggins. And Phil, the, I guess the first question I'll ask is, how does it feel to be an NEA National Heritage Fellow? It, it's, it's just amazing. It's, you know, it's probably going to take a while to come into complete focus, but just to be re recognized like that way in my own home, it was, it was pretty amazing. All right, and uh, Phil is a, a resident of Tacoma Park, Maryland, so he's he's from the D.C. area, and right. uh, this is his hometown. Uh, and he picked some uh, music, some interesting music from the archive to perform for us. So why don't you tell us about the songs that you chose? Okay, well, um, Jennifer Cutting um, was was very helpful to me. She sent me some some great uh, choices of this one particular harmonic player whose name I can't remember right now and who I had not heard of before, and so it was great. Um, getting to know his music, but I was I was more kind of interested in in doing music that didn't already have har harmonica. Um, so I, I chose two songs um, that were both recorded at Parchment uh, Penitentiary by Alan Lomax. Um, as far as I could tell, it's, they seem to be um, recorded 20 years apart. So mm -hmm. the first one was court recorded in 1939, which was uh, Charles Butler singing this beautiful song, um, Diamond Joe, um, which I had heard uh, once before and just and, and fallen in love with it. Uh, from the, the, the same recording, um, just, well, I mean, I, I could 
I guess the main point that I'm getting at is that at the time I first heard it, I never imagined myself actually trying <laughs> to, to sing it in, in public. So, so it was a great opportunity for me because between what has happened to me between now and then is that my, my partner, um, John Cephas, of over 30 years passed away. And as you probably remember, John had that beautiful baritone voice. And mm -hmm. so at that time, I wasn't doing much singing at all. And um, but since John has passed, um, I've been doing a lot of singing. Um, I, I guess you could say I've been getting better at it, but at least I've been uh, gaining more more confidence about it. Um, and so so you know, it was a, a challenge, but I, I really enjoyed uh, learning that song and and working up the courage to actually sing it in, in public. And what, so, uh, what appealed to you about Diamond Joe so much, do you remember? Well, it's, you know, it's a cappella, and, the, and the, this guy, Charles Butler, had a, has a beautiful voice. Um, someone, someone today describing it said it's like right almost on the edge of, of yodeling some of the time. Right. And it's a beautiful melody. It's... it's um, you know, it's it's not a, a simple melody. I mean, you know, when you listen to it, at first it sounds simple, but he's doing some pretty cool things with the melody. Um, there's a couple of times where you, where you think he's going to hit a note, and and then he hits the note a half step flat from what you thought he was going to hit, and so it's it's got some nice surprises in it, and it's just it's just beautiful, and. Well, the the recording is interesting because you know it's it's he's he's performing it at Parchman penitentiary and you can hear Ellen Lomax's voice in in the background and he, in a way he's kind of shouting at him you know <laughs> it doesn't I mean it doesn't sound like you know I guess it, it seems almost to me like he's talking to him in a way that he thinks he's used to being spoken mm -hmm. to in that in that setting it's not it's not doesn't seem that respectful or anything to me. Well, it's kind I'll, of dis distracting in a way. Yeah, I'll say one thing about that. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that that's actually the recording was actually made by John Lomax, who was Alan's father. John, Lo that's yeah. that's what I, and, I'm sorry. And that's yeah, what John, I meant to say. Yeah. John had a had a way of speaking that sounded that way. I'm I, yeah. I'm sure he didn't mean it to sound that way, but you're mm -hmm. you, I know what you mean when yeah. you talk about that tone of voice. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. I mean, you know, you 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 immediately feel that it's a very different time yeah. than we're than, than we're living in now. And um, I mean, you know, it's 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 amazing that he captured that. You know, and um, of course, I, you know, so there's no harmonica in it, and the, and the song has this great verse. That is just like custom made to intro a harmonica uh -huh. solo. He says, says, "I'm going up on the mountain. Give my horn a blow." I thought I heard my Maybell say, "Yonder comes my bow." You know, right after that, there should be harmonica. Definitely. And um, so that's what I took it. You know, I mean, because there's no other instruments in it. But and and it was surprising to me that there were notes that he sang that I wished that I was wishing laid in a different place on the harmonica where I could really lean into them and bend them and all, but they they kind of, um, you know, worked against me, mm -hmm. which was which was cool because, you know, I wasn't able just to do my normal hot dog and, and what, you know, my own normal comfort zone. I had to just t take those notes where I found them and, and figure out a way to get the most expression out of them, and, uh, which was a, a challenge, but I mean, it made me play completely differently, and it and it made the end result something different than what I thought I wanted at at the beginning. But you know, in the end, you know, I I liked I liked the challenge, and I liked where it, where it took me. Mm -hmm. Well, we loved it as well, and uh, I'll tell everyone who's watching this video that you can see Phil's performance uh, on the Library of Congress website in the Lomax or the the archive challenge. Um, uh, concert video mm -hmm. and the original performance actually is on our website as well in the John and uh, Ruby Lomax collection the Southern Mosaic it's called so you can search for that as well mm -hmm. on our website you can hear both Phil and the source recording that he used so that's uh -huh. a that's cool. a great story so what about the the second one which was years later but also at Parchment right yeah true true and that's it's just kind of a funny coincidence but the the second one is one that I was pretty familiar with um, I was surprised to find the recording there. Um, the, the, the performance 
the, the person performing it there was uh, John Dudley, mm -hmm. uh, who I, who was you know at, at, I guess serving time at, at Parchman. Um, his 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 version of that song seems to be uh, from from here in uh, the Tommy Johnson uh, Big Road Blues, but there you know and it's got that this great like driving bass uh, line that for like uh, about the first eight bars is real syncopated and then switches to kind of a loping more of a steady loping beat and it's so it's so distinctive it just like and it makes you want to get off your butt mm -hmm. you know and just like and it, it and you know i've been aware of that song for a long time and um so it was great to find find that version of it um and then there are some other there are some other songs where people just like just like John Dudley did heard heard uh, Tommy Johnson's version and then and then took from that you know and made their own version. Um, there's a there's a version of it that that I kind of blended into that um, called Stop and Listen that that is done by the Mississippi Sheiks mm -hmm. and um, it's the same that same groove but it's completely different. Uh, words and they're you know they're really great really good um, lyrics and so I like that so I'm I, so I mixed the two and and also mixed in there is a little bit of uh, smokestack lightning the, mm -hmm. the howlin wolf song so you know it's it's all you know um, it's I mean it's interesting to me because I'm aware that that there's some people that that take those Lomax recordings and that are basically you know frozen in time and they just try to recreate them note for note, but right. but those the, those people that they recorded, you know, if you recorded them the next day, you would have got right. something completely different. And sometimes yeah. Alan did that. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um and and so to me, it's 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 that that's the tradition that I want to follow is is to, you know, just take the influences, do my own thing with them, improvise with them. Um, and 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 come up with something you know that's living that's not you know just like frozen in time or right. a carbon copy of as like I said today um, when I was doing Diamond Joe and I, I said, basically I said I, I don't know what's about to happen so there might be a little bit of Bessie Jones mixed in with the with the uh, Charles Butler and, it, and that turned out to be true <laughs> right I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull it off but I mean that to me is what I, I love about music is is the the improvisation, the spontaneity of it, you know. And how did you decide to add a piano to that one? Um, you know that 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 bass line that I'm talking about. I mean, you just. I mean, to me, because I love piano. Piano is probably about my favorite instrument. I grew up. You know, my 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 parents loved piano music. Most of the records they collected were piano, and that 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 syncopated bass line. I, I think probably Tommy Johnson and, and whoever else, I think they were mimicking piano mm -hmm. on that. And so I, 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 I just heard piano. And um, so, and because I mean, I had a choice. I could have brought a you know guitar player, but I wanted that piece done on piano because it lays so nice on the piano and it just, I think it's the way it was meant to be. Yeah, sounded yeah. great, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, you, you really touched on something important there, which is that these guys in 1959 and even 1939 yeah. were already listening to commercial recordings, so they, they were being influenced by more than one thing right. <laughs> when, right. they, when they played it, and yes. the people who originally recorded it were probably influenced by piano players they'd heard and other yeah. Yeah. people. And so to keep it, you know, as you say, frozen in time is it just doesn't doesn't really um, continue the tradition in mm -hmm. the same way that the tradition was going back then. I yeah, think. yeah. And I don't like like the song Diamond Joe. I don't. I, I couldn't really, or I haven't yet found out w w where Bessie Jones got her version of it. But I could tell that the Charles Butler. I mean, there was just a couple of tiny little things, almost like incidental. I mean, you could you could miss them. But that kind of clued me in that he definitely had heard mm -hmm. the version of it that she's singing. Yeah. So. 
So those influences are always there. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for playing in the concert. We really enjoyed having you, and it's an honor to have a National Heritage Fellow on our <laughs> stage always. Uh, well, thank and you. And it's an honor to have you, even before you were a National <laughs> Heritage Fellow. We had well, you several times, and it was an honor then, too. So. Well, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's just, you know, and um, as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to go get my uh, Library of Congress library card renewed. I think it's... <laughs> Please do. And yeah. Come see us in the reading room. We'll find you more great stuff. All right, great. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. September 20th, 2017, and we've just had the American Folklife Center Archive Challenge concert in the Coolidge Auditorium here at the Library of Congress. And for that concert, we asked uh, five different individuals or groups to uh, record songs that they learned from our archive. And one of the artists that we asked to do that was Dom Flemons. And I'm here with Dom Flemons now, and we're going to have a little conversation about uh, the songs that he played. But the first question I'll ask you is, Dom, since you've been at the library since the last time you played here, I think, you've uh, started to perform under the rubric of the American Songster. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the name, the American Songster, and the Songster tradition? Well, of course. Well, thank you so much for having me, Stephen. And uh, well, the American Songster. First, that that was actually I named one of my albums uh, uh, the Amer uh, just American Songster. And what got me to do that was, um, well, specifically with one of the artists I, whose tune I performed, Lead Belly. When I started studying the music of uh, not just Lead Belly, but people like Mance Lipscomb and a couple of the other performers, um, they w they're in, under the umbrella term of like blues singers most of the time, but as I started reading more about these musicians, they were known as songsters. And songsters were, um, first they were like books of song lyrics in the 19th century, and then the 20th century, a lot of different musicians that could play and sing a lot of different types of numbers, they became known as songsters like the book. So it was kind of like a human jukebox. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a, well, you know, as a musician uh, that's uh, come up in the time as the 20th century's ended and the 21st century started, the full consciousness of that people are into a lot of different types of music, that's something I've always tried to emphasize in my work, just because I'm not just a blues singer or folk singer or country singer. I play a little bit of it all. I, I love the term songster because it was just, it was something people hadn't heard before, but mm -hmm. it was actually something a lot older. So it was really cool to have that juxtaposition of, of both new and old at the same time. And then American, of course, is, that's where I'm from, you know, and I, to really emphasize American identity with Songster and being able to bring all these different ideas together was appealing to me. So when I broke away from uh, my previous group, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, I wanted to figure out how to uh, put a bigger idea out there and instead of just saying, hey, I'm Dom Flemons, I, you know, I wanted to have a bigger idea. So the American Songster ended up being something that people could latch on to that term or my name, and it, it just gave just something a little bit bigger than just myself. I'm trying to represent a larger tradition. Mm -hmm. And you've uh, recorded, you're one of the few of the artists in the concert who've recorded material from our archive before. Um, so in this case, you were, you were, you sort of were on familiar ground. Uh, oh, and you chose, the first song you chose was Poor Howard. So uh, oh, yeah. ex explain a little bit about that and how you found it. Well, Poor Howard a, is an interesting number in the way that, you know, the first time I actually heard it was on the great, uh, three record set that Electra Records put out of uh, Lead Belly, uh, the Library of Congress recordings. And my first introduction to Lead Belly's music of, um, you know, I, was when I got into Bob Dylan's music and his song, uh, Song for Woody, mm -hmm. mentions, uh, you know, Cisco and Sonny and Lead Belly too. So, you know, being the sort of inquisitive person I am, I decided to figure out who these guys were. And of course that led me to Smithsonian Folkways and, and Lead Belly. I always like to describe him as like the, uh, the Rosetta Stone of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of uh, African-American folk music. Just because, um, especially since I was you know, born in the late 20th century, uh, most African-American folk music is, uh, a lot of it is, is blues and jazz and spiritual music, church music of different types. And uh, Lead Belly just represented this sort of bigger idea, just like the Rosetta Stone to this sort of mm -hmm. ancient world of music. And, and also that he recorded so many different versions and different types of songs. Uh, it really let me um, be able to delve into, you know, just a, not just a bunch of different types of material, but Lead Belly also performed many of the songs, different tempos, different styles, and just different ways of doing it. And so Poor Howard, there's this one particular version that he did that uh, uh, Larry Cohen um, 
uh, compiled for the Electra set that just really blew me away. And it's a, it, it's all a section in, in, on the record that's uh, listed as Suki Jumps, which was um, kind of a square dance music in, in for Lead Belly. And it, it featured that song as well as um, Gwana Dig a Hole to Put the Devil In. And I thought that those two songs would go really great as a, a medley together. So I decided to put Poor Howard together. And of course, the story that he told, uh, Alan Lomax, he, he said that Poor Howard was the first Negro fiddler from, uh, that was freed from slavery. And that was his like main mm -hmm. theme song was Poor Howard. So I thought that was great. And the idea of being Poor Howard is uh, dead and gone. He left me to hear to sing this song. And as the American songster, I can kind of make it reflective so that you know, because in my shows when I when I play it, I can tell people, you know, this is a song that really uh, symbolizes what I try to do. Because I try to uh, I try to get the impression, the emotion, maybe the rhythm, the whatever it might be, the, the raw essence of what that original field recording had, and be able to present it in a way that is both uh, uh, it it it. Uh, it both uh, emphasizes what I do as a musician personally, as well as what that original recording put out there. Because you know, when when I started studying uh, Alan Lomax's material, especially after working with the Library of Congress, talking about you know choreometrics and cantometrics and all that, it, he talks a lot about how there are sort of like there are nuances that are right be below the surface that really. Uh, uh, they resonate with people. So when you see certain nuances or subtleties to music, uh, you can relate to them, especially if you're familiar with it. Like if you hear a blues song and they, they hit that blues lick in the right way, you can just say, that's it, that's it. And so I've always tried to have, have that uh, in my music. And so Poor Howard is a great one for that. And Guana Dig a Hole to Put the Devil in is just a, it's just a, a great little fun great uh, square dance number. So I wanted to have both those together. And I also wanted to... Uh, reference um, Pete Seeger as well because Pete, Pete was really close with Lead Belly uh, and Lead Belly really helped Pete get on the trajectory that he did and um, the idea of the banjo being an, an African derived instrument and also it being a, 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 there's a proverb called Sankofa and the banjo does that it, it brings the past into the present and that's something that Pete did as well with uh, with his music, bringing bringing the past into the present, creating a new way for the future. So that was that was what I was thinking about with that one, mm -hmm. and and uh, yeah, it, it's one I've been able to say I, I'm proud to say that I was able to take that to the Candy Center with uh, the Lead Belly at 125. <laughs> right. That was a big thing, and uh, being able to take it to Carnegie Hall when they did the the Lead Belly tribute concert, mm -hmm. that was something as well. So uh, on top of what I learned with that original recording, being able to take it into my own personal repertoire, I've then been able to take it out there and show people uh, what this music's all about too. All right. Yeah, and Lead Belly, of course, was a songster in the mm -hmm. same sense, and the song is about being a songster. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it's very much uh, reflective of what you do, and and uh, sort of a perfect fit for your repertoire. So we're we're really glad that you that you brought that one for us. Um, the other song that you sang uh, is related to some extent to a project that you're working on now uh, about cowboy songs. So tell us a little about how you got interested in cowboy songs uh, oh, yeah. in the first place. Well, you know, I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona, so cowboy songs and cowboy culture is something that I've, I've just known about ever since I got into music, even before I played guitar. Like mm -hmm. cowboy poetry and cowboy songs is something that I was interested in. I mentioned I was into Bob Dylan. That easily gets you to Ramblin' Jack Elliott, right. so he was also a conduit to get in there. Also, um, you know, in my college at uh, Northern Arizona University, they had all of the Library of Congress uh, records, all the LPs, and so I first heard Goodbye Old Paint on the cowboy cowboy songs, ballads, and cattle you know cattle calls from Texas. That that's that great record there. So I was interested in cowboy music and also the New World Records album Back in the Saddle, which is a great anthology of cowboy stuff. So I'd never played much cowboy music at first, but it was a, an idea that was interesting to me because uh, my family has roots deep in uh, Arizona. My dad's from Flagstaff, Arizona, and then his father was from East Texas, and then came over to Flagstaff in the early 1950s, and then he started uh, uh, his church, Church of God in Christ, uh, 
in uh, Holbrook, Arizona. So he was called by God to go to Holbrook, mm -hmm. which is, um, as I then studied, uh, Holbrook was one of the baddest towns in the West. And uh, it was also the first place where cattle were brought into Arizona via the train. And so there were a lot of just interesting little stories that were wrapped up. So my own personal interest in black cowboys, when I first saw that that was a, a piece of the puzzle, you know, even though you don't see them a lot in books and in movies, the African-American culture has, has pervaded in the West for a long time, even before the Southwest was part of the United States mm -hmm. and it was a part of Mexico. There's a big history deep within that. And uh, so the album just started expanding into this bigger idea. I was um, traveling on I-40 from uh, North Carolina, where I've lived for a lot of years, to go visit family. And I came across a book called The Negro Cowboys by Philip Dunham. And it was a really, just started expanding my idea of what, how big the story of black cowboys was. Um, also, uh, the Lomaxes did some wonderful field recordings of, uh, you know, um, people like, uh, I don't know, Big Charlie Butler, who did uh, Diamond Joe, like, uh, mm -hmm. like Phil Wiggins did earlier in the concert. And uh, then also there were people like uh, Pete Harris, who was, uh, had a style that was similar to another a musician who recorded in the 1920s, Henry Ragtime, Texas, right. uh, Thomas. And so there's just sort of like a lot of, just a lot of material, a lot of stylistic things. And then of course, the cornerstone for my project, Black Cowboys, uh, is uh, Goodbye Old Paint and Jess Morris's story about how these black cowboys that he met early on in his life taught him how to play Goodbye Old Paint and uh, also taught him how to play the fiddle too. And that was something that was really a part of his musical education. And of course, that's something that I've talked with a lot in my career, um, talking about how um, you have these situations where you have performers that are, that are not African-American. They will take the music a certain place and it will become very popular. Mm -hmm. But by their own admission, it, the roots of their music has a, mu a kind of a cultural interchange that's within it. And, you mm -hmm. know, of course, that's something that we all know on a ground level. People love music and they all get together because of that. But with the Cowboys story, that uh, hadn't been something that had been talked about in an album form. And so I wanted to, to try to just, uh, I don't know, fill the gap yeah. in that way. I mean, I think it's similar with country music, too, that A.P. Carter learned so much from African-American folks as well. And it kind of got erased from the history for a while, but people like Mike Seeger and yourself are, you know, bringing that history back. Absolutely. So, yeah. So it's great. So how did you decide to do Goodbye Old Paint on the banjo? Well, with good. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you yeah. did it on the guitar. Yeah. Well, uh, you know. Well, funny enough, with goodbye old paint, that's something that has to do with keys. You know, like at first, of course, I had the song, and I knew that the, I wanted to be a part of it. So then I went back to the field recording, and I started listening back to it, and I realized that it was in the key of E flat when I listened to it. And E flat happens to be a key that I can. It's kind of like the top of my range, right. so I can kind of do like a, a kind of like a bluegrassy sort of like yell with uh, an E flat. And so when I heard that, I said, great, it would be an E flat. And uh, Jess Morris has a, it's a really loopy little tune that he records and it's different every verse. <laughs> so I had to, I just straightened it out in that way. And uh, you know, when starting to play it on the guitar, I ran into a wonderful fellow at the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering named Don Edwards. And he's just a, I mean, he's just a phenomenal player, a great singer of, of all different types. And he was very much uh, someone who helped me think about how I wanted to craft this whole project because he's very multifaceted with mm. how he handles cowboy music as well. But we got into talking about uh, black cowboys. And for him, he was telling me how, you know, a lot of times the scholarship around uh, cowboy music tends to be focused on the British Isles and the ballad traditions and which is a very strong part of it. But he also mentioned that several of the songs that he heard had kind of a, a sense of the blues, almost like a, like, kind of like a song like Going Down the Road Feeling Bad. Not really like blues as we think of blues, blues, 12 bars, but kind of uh, just had a bit of that feeling and that sort of, sort of uh, structure melodically that, that would uh, really uh, be emphasized with the blues later. And so uh, the conversation he and I had about it, it just got me thinking, okay, well, if I think of Jess Morris learning from this black cowboy, how might he have sung it if he had just a tonality of the blues that's 
not quite the blues, but it has a little bit of that tone. And so Goodbye Old Paint happens to be a great number for, because um, in string band music you have the same thing, where there's not a lot of chord changes, but you can bend little notes up and down and create a lot of uh, really nice give and take and a lot of suspense with uh, just a what would be a very monotone song. And so uh, Good Violet Pain I thought was just a wonderful one to be able to do that. Stretch a couple of notes up, have a couple of short notes, and be able to tell a, a very interesting story. Because um, it's like, uh, I still am, it, I, it still surprises me, even when I'm performing it, how emotional the song is. Because it's, yeah. It's very simple words to it, you know, but when you get about three or four verses into it, all of a sudden it's like um, it's like a movie that plays out in your in your mind, and it's a very beautiful song in that way, and that's where it has that really great juxtaposition of what would become the blues, but also the same qualities that narrative ballads in the you know in the uh, in the the British Isles traditions have so it's kind of a really nice mixture of both yeah yeah you really get a sense of the reluctance to leave through him saying i'm leaving so many times but not leaving you know my yeah. uh, things are he says what's in his hand and mm -hmm. he's you know he's he's all set to leave but he doesn't leave for a long time and you can feel that that emotion in there well you know that's a big part of the theme that i found when i started delving into the black cowboy story is you had this sense of movement because you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, like a lot of times we think of the United States as being the whole landmass, but before the 1840s, it, it went pretty much out to Tennessee, and then the, it went up to the Ohio River. And then slowly and steadily, you started having, you know, the, the, the landmass and the states begin to move west. And one of the things that happened, especially with African-American culture, is that each time they added a new state, they'd have to decide whether it was going to be pro-slavery or anti-slavery. Yeah. And then even Texas for a long time before the Civil War really, you know, started really going into full force, you know, you had uh, plantation owners, they would take their slaves and they'd bring them to Texas because it was literally outside the borders of the United States. Right. But because of all these different things, it led to this huge African-American population. And again, you know, you have things like Catholicism as well. That was a big part of the Mexican half. And you had this mixture of cultures that happened really in this right, again, right below the surface. And uh, the Black Cowboy story is wrapped up in all these things. But, uh, you know, Good Bottle Paint kind of has that feel because, you know, uh, the... Going from Cheyenne, Wyoming, you know, that was all the way from Texas, and they'd go all the way up to Abilene, Kansas to get the, um, get the cattle to the train. Because at first, Abilene, Kansas was the one place you could have, uh, you, you had the cattle going on the train. Yeah, the rail, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so this, this idea that you had to keep moving in spite of all of it is just something that is a big part of cowboy culture and then also, of course, African-American culture with cowboys. Mm -hmm. it's, and so like, got, Good Bottle Paint really grabs all of those themes in a, again, in a very subtle way, which is what makes it a, you know, probably a, why it's one of the most well-known cowboy songs. And then, of course, that's, that's a part of the joy in performing it. Right. Well, thanks so much for taking the Archive Challenge, and we should tell the viewers that you can actually watch this concert. It's called the, the American Folklife Center, Center Archive Challenge Concert, and it's online at the Library of Congress website. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.